What is the future of Earth as a building material? What happens when you bring mud together with robots, for example? What kind of new hybrid is produced at that moment? Man's oldest building technology? Man's newest building technology? And to me, that's, that's really beautiful. Ron, you are an architect and an artist. Some also might say activist. And I wonder how you think about the relationship between those two words, art and architecture. I have a pretty clear definition between the two. And I discovered it in about 2004 when I was working on a project called Prada Marfa with Elm Green and Dragset. I always think about that project as a project that blurs the line between art and architecture because it's a building, but it's also an installation in the desert. At one point during that process, I found that it clearly fell into the context of art. As the architects of the project, my studio was designing it, and we overlooked the fact that it was encroaching on the power line easement above by two feet. Uh -huh. And the building was already three feet tall in construction. Uh -huh. And so right away, it started to draw versions of the building that were two feet smaller. Yeah, to because, accommodate the codes and rules exactly, and regulations. Yeah. Because that's what architects do. We accommodate <laughs> for the codes and rules and regulations. And I presented this to everyone, and they said, no, we are not changing this. We're raising the power lines. And that's when I realized, okay, this is, this is art. The real distinction for me is that architecture is a design discipline that solves problems. And art isn't bound to that responsibility. It does, does not have to solve problems. It does not have to be functional. Yeah. It can be entirely useless. Right. And uh, that's, the, that's the beauty of art. And so that project demonstrated to me that architecture could communicate uh, political ideas. That's a lovely transition into thinking more and more about your practice. I wonder if you think about um, putting the, the name art versus architecture on some of your own projects. You know, I, I never apply those disciplinary boundaries to my own work. I kind of know what people think architecture is, and it's the making of buildings. Sometimes I make buildings, but I don't apply those boundaries because um, I think I'm not doing either of them. And so, for example, I hosted an event once. Um, that inserted a teeter-totter into the wall between the United States and Mexico. For me, that was an event. And the most interesting thing to me about that event, outside of what occurred that day between communities and families, was how the art world co-opted it. And they said, that is art. Describe a little bit more the context of that project and what you were trying for. Yeah. I mean, it, it originally started because I was making illustrations to tell a story about the consequences of the construction of a border wall. I don't want to say it falls into the realm of a political cartoon because it's not that either. But it was just an illustration to communicate that the border is kind of a metaphorical fulcrum between U.S. and Mexico relationship. But I guess because I am a designer, uh, there are design considerations, like how does this sit on the wall? And, you know, how does it insert into the wall? And so I played that out as a reality and built the object. It was a full-scale model, and it sat in a shop in, in Juarez for several months. And it was just there, wrapped in plastic and waiting for me to come and get it. Then there was just this moment where the child separation really affected me. Um, and so I and my studio and friends on both sides decided, let's have an event and use these things because they're just sitting there. And so it was a really humble event. Somewhere along the way, an AP photographer heard word that we were having this event and he asked if he could join. And I said, sure. And the next day he uploaded it to some <laughs> distribution company in Germany and he went worldwide. And that's yeah. how that unfolded. Mm -hmm.
I love this idea that it's it's not about whether something is art or is architecture or is activism, but it's more of a kind of what if. What if a border wall is architecture? How does that change what we think a border wall is? Right, because if, if we say a border wall is architecture, we have to acknowledge that architecture has clients, architecture has budgets. And if we think about that border wall and we think, who are the clients that it serves? Exactly. Who's funding that wall? What are the budgets for that wall? What are the consequences of that wall? When you think about the word relevance and trying to do something that feels relevant, what synonyms or thoughts come forward for you? Yeah, I, I think that importance is a, is a synonym. What is important to a place? And one of the ways we might understand what is important is to have a deep understanding of place, and both historically and culturally, and what's happening in the present. And so for me, that is the, it's the best way to think about uh, this issue of, of relevance. I, I think sometimes in the design world, relevance is placed on the relevance of the creator, of the, of the designer or the, the artist. The signature. Right, the signature. And is, is it culturally relevant relative to uh, the person who produced it? And I, I think it's relevant more so in the way that it, it addresses its moment in time when it's created and how it's absorbed into the, the, the culture. Is the wall itself important? To some it is, and to some it's not, but the issue of its existence is important. Yeah, and it seems also for you, especially as somebody who's architecturally trained, this deeper investigation of place is the, is the thing that produces relevance. So in thinking about where we wanted to cite this conversation, you thought that you might want to be with us here in Daydreams uh, yeah. by Patrick Doherty. It reminded me very much of the place where I'm from, which is the southernmost part of Colorado on the Colorado-New Mexico border in a high mountain valley. It's very much like Tippet Rise. This feels a lot like home in many ways. Same kind of plants, same kind of landscape. But it was also the northernmost part of the Mexican Republic prior to the Mexican-American War. There are uh, many abandoned buildings in rural environments because the migrations that occurred after the Depression, after the Second World War, the playgrounds of my childhood were abandoned houses. All of those houses were made out of mud. I would go into these houses and explore them and discover the way that the light came through the roof because the shingles had blown off, the way that vegetation had taken over the insides of these places, <laughs> the way that artifacts were left behind, and there was evidence and memory of a past life. There are places where I learned a lot about architecture. And not only the way buildings were constructed, because it became visible through their deconstruction over time, but also the way architecture could be elevated. Daydreams has all of those kind of components. You walk in, the light filters in from the roof, uh, through the windows, you're surprised by the discovery of this vegetation that grew in the inside. It's definitely become something else. It's the perfect title, which is, a, for me, it's a daydream. One project that I'm working on now is uh, a circa 1854 Tabawachi Ute Indian Agency, where all the families from my community come from. Uh, it was a place of child separation. It was a place of indigenous slavery. It was the home to the Ute Indian agent. One thing that he was tasked to do around the time of the Civil War is to document all of the uh, captive slaves housed in the surrounding counties, the majority of whom were children who had been separated from their indigenous families. And so these lists that he created are some of the most important documents, not only of indigenous slavery, but it's slavery in general. And so I'm trying to tell these hidden stories uh, of my community, uh, but which also reflect a larger understanding of what, what occurred and, and the, the legacies that those traumas had on communities all over the world. So the, the first thing we did is we had a, a community day where we invited people to learn the traditional techniques of earthen plaster, which I learned from my father, and which has been carried on for generations to remod buildings. 
and that stabilized the buildings. And then I, I invited the artist Chip Thomas, who's a paste-up graffiti artist, to do the first work of invited art on the building. And what Chip did is he took the lists that list the children, their age, when they were purchased, the tribe from there, from their baptized name, and he placed it on the facade of the building itself to tell those stories of that particular place. In many ways, Chip, who is African-American and lives on the Navajo reservation and is a medical doctor, he's actually nurturing some of his own truths uh, in that project uh, related to healing, uh, the truth about his own history of enslavement. What's important about your sense of relevance is how much friction and violence and displacement can be part of what the relevant history is. And thinking about your own practice and even the earliest forms that you began to work with and encounter, you brought up working with mud and that you're still playing in the mud. Two assemblies I've brought together are mud and technology, or mud and robotics mm -hmm. yeah. and computational design. I wrote a book called Earth Architecture. It talked about Earth as a contemporary architectural material. And I posited that 3D printing might be the future because it's fundamentally an additive assembly endeavor, just like additive manufacturing. And so I started then saying, I wanted to be the person who explored that. In the last four years, I've developed a robot along with industry partnerships, uh, some software and techniques for 3D printing mud using robotics at very large scales. That's a mix of references that might not seem authentic to someone. It's not uh, recalling the true, pure, earliest of histories. And what would you say back to that about what it means to mix new technologies with these old technologies? Yeah, I mean, on one hand, um, you're right. Humans developed in relationship to clay. And we, we have evidence of this for 30,000 years that we've been doing this with our bodies. And I say that we as humans have been doing this all along. And the 3D printer is a new tool that allows us to manipulate the material and form it and shape it. But it doesn't discount the legacy from which it comes. My family has probably lived in buildings made of mud for at least a thousand years, if not longer. And so to draw from those histories that I was very connected to intergenerationally, and to just implement a new tool is part of an authentic legacy whose outcome is now this, and I hope will continue uh, beyond me. Peter and Kathy Halstead uh, articulate the, the hope to have this place be a place for poetry, art, music, as well as the land and the sky, that in a sort of mix, there it creates an algorithm that creates more than the sum of its parts. And I wonder about how that mission might relate to how you think about your own assemblies. It's interesting how you use the word assembly, and assembly is the coming together of many things, yeah. right? And, and fundamental to my definition of a border is that a border isn't uh, something that defines the distinction between two places. It's not something that separates two places, but it's something that brings two places together. It's the moment of union. It's the moment of the assembly. I am a hybrid of many assemblies, being from both colonial and indigenous backgrounds. And so when you describe all of these different facets of Tippet Rise, poetry, music, landscape, sky, it's not that these are distinct pieces, but it's the assembly of them the coming together of poetry and sky and land and music that I think makes this place very special. You responded to the work of Ensemble Studio that use human-made materials that create structures that recall geologic rock formation. They're really interesting because they're actually using the earth as a tool. The beautiful thing about casting is that it takes an imprint. And so the moment you take an imprint of the earth, you're actually capturing that geology. But it's mediated by technology, right? And the technology there is the very thin layer of plastic 
I really love that you can see the earth still stuck to the face. It blurs the boundary between the understanding of concrete in an expression that attempts to feel natural and simultaneously corresponding with materials that are natural. You think about this place and the layers of history and think, what are some thoughts that you might share here in the last bit about where you'd like to see it go? I think that um, places like this can sometimes feel like an island or they can feel exclusive. And so it's been lovely to hear the way that it's interfacing in the ecologies that exist outside the boundaries of the property lines of Tippet Rise. And so I think continuing that practice is really important to making a healthy place that we don't draw lines between different disciplines of art or different ecologies. And I think the welcoming of people and animals and time are going to be a really special consequence to the future of this place. Well, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> that was a beautiful that was really inspiration lovely. for the next next round of connection and exchange that we might yeah. have here. Thank yeah. you for being here. Thank you so much.